I want to welcome those who are being able to join us via YouTube or Facebook. These are posted on Sunday night because the only way to see us live and experience the wonderful choir that we have here and the wonderful fellowship we have is to be here in the building. Like I've said before, it is time to come home. Everything worth having is right here. You say, well, I can call Domino's or I can call Waiter to get food delivered to my house, but you cannot get what you have here unless you come in the presence of our Savior. Let us go to Him in prayer this morning. Most gracious Heavenly Father, I pray, Lord God, then thanks because you have already poured out your presence in this place. We have already experienced your presence, Lord God, in song and in fellowship. And we are so thankful for that, that you have chosen to spend your Sunday, Lord God, with us. It is not the other way around. Father, we are praying for the service this morning. Let your anointing fall upon us as we deliver your word. And Lord God, let us be receptive to what you have to say. All these things we ask in our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. Amen. So glad you're all here with us. I am so glad that I am here. I'm glad for your attendance, and now I am fully faithful in your attention as well. Uh, Just as a reminder, we will have communion this morning. We have the elements here. You'll have a time to be able to come forward if you have not collected them already. And those who are watching on the recording, you can have your elements ready. The communion will be toward the end of the service. I started a sermon series last week, and you know, we stayed in James forever, and we did a while. We did um, um, Gideon for a while, but when I didn't really intend for this to be a series, but then I saw something this week that said, you know what, it's just going to have to be, because I read this this week. So if the pastor sees his shadow on Groundhog Day, there will be six more weeks of this sermon series. So... I had no choice in the matter. I did indeed see my shadow. So we will continue upon the expectation that God has for us. The series is entitled Great Expectations. And it follows a line of, I know the expectations I have for you. That was last week's message. This week is the expectation that God has for us all to be faithful. He said, well, you're preaching that to us, and we're here. We are the faithful. But as much as I love having you here with us, that is not what faithfulness means. It is the full expression of the faith that we have in God. It's beyond just coming to church on Sunday mornings. The title of today's message is, Great is Thy Faithfulness. You know, we sung the song this morning, but you know what? What I think, I think God wants to sing that song to us. I think that when we have the opportunity to come before God, God wants to look at us and say, great is your faithfulness. And why, can I, why do I believe that? I believe that because I believe what Jesus himself told us. When we look at Matthew chapter 25 and 23, the words that we all want to hear when we come before the great throne of our judgment. And Jesus said what? He said that, well done, what? Good and faithful servant. He said, no, I've been good, I've been good, I've been good, but have you been faithful? That's what God wants to be able to tell us. Great is thy faithfulness. Faithful, I believe that is a reasonable and acceptable expectation of God is for us to be faithful. When we come together in marriage, what is the thing that we are looking for? A partner who's going to be what? Faithful. Whenever we join together in our relationship with Christ, because we do not participate in religion, we participate in a relationship between us and Christ, and there's that faithfulness that God's looking for. God gave us all a command, and we've done it before. What is the command He saved us? He told us what? Go ye. Go ye and do what? Go into all the world and do what? Proclaim the gospel. To be able to preach. That is what He wants us to be faithful to. I believe God has great faith in you because He gave that awesome responsibility to you, to all believers, not to me, not to missionaries, not just to pastors, preachers, teachers, but go ye, all of you, that that's our job to be able to proclaim the gospel. We're to share our faith with others. You say, okay, let's go back to the beginning. What is faith? Well, I'm glad you asked. Somebody out there asked. I heard you. What is faith? And it says real simple. Hebrews chapter 11 verse 1 tells us what? Now, faith is the assurance of things hoped for, the conviction of things not seen. I like how the New Living Living Translation puts it. Faith shows the reality of what we hope for. 
It is the evidence of what we cannot see. It's the reality of what we hope for. You may say, well, I hope this, I hope that happens. You know, I wish, I can't stand the word wish, but you may say, I I wish that would happen, I wish that would happen. No, we pray for things, is that what we do? We pray and then we pray in what? We pray in faith. That is our expectation. We're in Hebrews chapter 11, I'll give you a chance to turn there in your Bible this morning. Hebrews chapter 11 is known as the Hall of Fame of Faith. When I let Miss Deborah know what we were going to be in this week, she said, oh, I love that chapter. She said, that's the by faith chapter, and that's what it's known as. It is, though, indeed the hall of fame of the saints. Let's go ahead and start in Hebrews 11. Let's look at verses 1 through 3 first off. Hebrews 11, 1 through 3 tells us, Now faith is the assurance of things hoped for, the convictions of things not seen. For by it the people of old received their commendation. By faith we understand that the universe was created by the word of God, so that what is seen was not made out of things that are visible. It is important for us to remember the accomplishments of the people of old, as verse 2 puts it. You know why when I read that as a young man, I read it different than I do as a, a slightly less young man. Let me put it to you that way. It's important for us to remember the things that occurred to the people of old. But we also remember that verse 3 told us. Verse 3 told us what is seen is not made of things that are visible. Sometimes we put more faith into the people of old, the traditions, the things that we've done as a church. We put more faith sometimes into that than we do in this verse 3, which tells us about everything that we see was created by things that are Invisible, not visible. The church ever being built was done so in faith. Something that is not seen. This church, this congregation, and other churches, they were built in faith that someone would come. That someone would want to hear the word of God preached. That, it takes faith to do that. If you ever get a chance, go read the cornerstone on the building out here. That when they put that in the ground, they intended it to be there forever. They intended it to have a purpose in being That's why it was built. So the church was built in faith. Built by something you cannot see. But I've got to tell you, the reverse is the same too. The decline in the churches, in the number of people in churches. That was also done by something that we cannot see. And that is the opposite of faith. That is faithlessness, not faithfulness. And you say, oh, we can't blame us. We're here. We're here. And I know and I appreciate it. I'm glad that you're here. But not everyone is here. And we have to wonder, what could we do to change that? Faith is like the wind. You say you can't see the wind, but yet you see the effects of the wind, right? You see the leaves move on the trees, but yet you don't see it. Faith is the same way. You can see the repercussions of faithfulness. And you can see the replications of faithlessness. Doubt, if you will. Those things that people set aside and say that there is no God, that we don't need these things. But I believe that our growth here is a growth in faithfulness. And I believe that we will begin to see actions come up from that. We will see regrowth here. I believe that fully. We've seen it before over the years. We've seen the numbers come up and the numbers go down. And we blame it on whatever we want to name it on, COVID, blame it on weather, whatever it happens to be that the day that we can blame things on. But yet the thing that we have to hold to is our faithfulness in God who is faithful. The cornerstone of this building was put here because God had an intention for this church. God had a mission for this church. We will see it because we are hopeful, because we're designed to see God move again. And the most important thing is we are faithful that God will do it again. That's what keeps us coming every Sunday. We know what God has intended for us. I love a scripture I found this week in my reading. Ecclesiastes 3.15. It said, that which is already has been. That which is to be already has been. And God seeks what has been driven away. I said, wow, when I read that. We talk about the future. We talk about the present. We talk about the past. And a lot of times we look and we relate into the story of the prodigal son for once. 
You know, what did the, what did the father do? Well, it tells here that God seeks what has been driven away. We know in that story of the prodigal son, the father saw the son coming back when he was yet far down the road. The father never stopped looking. That's faithfulness. That's the faithfulness of God. That's the faithfulness he's looking for in us. Somebody asked me, what's the definition of faith? To me, the definition of faith is that whenever you have a prayer meeting for rain, you look out in the crowd and see who brought their umbrella. That is the faithfulness that I want to see. If I get sick and you come in to pray for me, you know what I want? I want people to come pray for me that have known and seen what the power of prayer does. I want, like Frank, I want the dead to come and pray for me. Those who have seen and know what power of prayer does. We've seen it in this church so many times. We know what it does. That's what I want praying for me is those who are full of faith because they have experienced it. They say, oh, well, you know, some people only believe what they see. You know what? I have no problem with seeing it. (laughs) Show me. Let me see. It doesn't decrease my faith when I see what God has done. I love what Hebrews 11 in that third verse says. If you begin to break things down, Hebrews 11, 3 says, By faith we understand. Somebody told me one time they were reading through the Bible, having trouble. I said, I'm having so much trouble. And I give them all these different things, you know, and it's, it, it's, written, it's spiritually written for those who are spiritually minded, scriptures say. Now I know, I wish I'd have had it, I would have known the answer. I said, By faith we understand. I can, I've been to school. I've taken all this class. I just send my transcripts in for the Bible classes I've taken over the years. I've took my, I went off to Bible college when I was 16 years old. I've got plenty of years worth of stuff. But all I needed was Hebrews 11.3, I think. By faith we understand. Because I can be taught everything. I can read everything. But what I need to do is understand. How many of you ever been talking to someone you can tell them, look, I can explain it to you, but I can't understand it for you. And it's just like that with us. We can read, we get into the Word, we must, because we are told what study that you show yourself to be approved. We must study, but then you know what? By faith we understand. And that scripture goes on to say this in the second part of that verse. It says, The universe was created by the Word of God. When I began to look at that and study into that one verse this week that set, had so much truth in one verse, I said, what was created? He said, well, it says the universe. I said, well, what is not in the universe? Well, everything we know is in the universe. So I said, I can read that to say that all was created by the Word of God. Everything was created by the Word of God. We know in Genesis it says what, that, Jesus, that God did what? He spoke. He said, let there be light, and there was light. Everything that came to creation was spoken by the Word of God. Everything was created by the Word of God. Then how can we not think that every answer, every understanding, all that we need is also found in the Word of God? That is where we need to turn to. That's what we need to go to, is being able to read it and read it in faith so we don't just read it, but we want, we understand it. And based on Ecclesiastes 3.15, which I just read, said, what that which is already has been, that which is to be, be already has been. I believe that in reading that all that has been, all that is, and all that will be has already been. Then that tells me that everything can be restored by the Word of God. If everything was created by the Word of God, then everything can be restored by the Word of God. I don't know what you need restored in your life. It may be your life. It may be your health. It may be your marriage. It may be whatever that you have. Everything can be restored by the Word of God. I believe that that's a promise that is given to us. Everything, everything, everything. You say, I don't understand. Just we go right back to it. We understand by what? By faith. A lot of times when I'm reading scriptures, I'm like the old Abin and Costello, who's on first. No, you know, he goes, out, no, who's on second? And, you know, oh, and now I just yell out third base. You know, we're just like, what goes here? What goes here? I don't understand it because I'm not moving in what? Faith. I just need to move in faith. You know that gag, that Abbott and Costello gag does not work if the players are there with their names written on the back of their jerseys? It doesn't work, right? 
Because sometimes you have to see it in writing. How many old movies have you watched that said, man, if they'd have had cell phones, this movie would have been about 30 seconds long. <laughs> it's just, it just so many things that are just knocked out quickly by the word. Two people that need to have a conversation. That's what happens with this Bible. This is two having a conversation. God and you. You and God. And we do it by what? By faith. Because everything was created by the Word of God. Everything is restored by the Word of God. That's why I stress the Word of God so much. I don't tell a lot of stories. I, don't, I very seldom read a poem. I, I use very few quotes. And if I do, it's normally going to be by those people who have their source within the Word of God. There's power in the Word of God. There is life in the Word of God. Scripture tells us that life and death are found in the power of the what? The tongue. So then can you imagine what the power the tongue of God himself has? By what he has spoken, by what he has said? So much so that Jesus is defined to us as what? As the word of God incarnate. John 1.1. 1, 1. I'm going to read it for you all again. You all know what it says. We cannot say we seek or serve God as we do if we don't seek or serve the power that's found in the word of God. How can I say I love God if I don't read what he's written to me? When you dated and you got love letters, did you take them? Oh, that's beautiful. You smell them. Oh, that's wonderful. And put it in a drawer. No, you took them and you read them. And if you're really good, you actually wrote back. <laughs> Amen? Or at least say, hey, I got your letter. It may be four pages long and you say, love you too. <laughs> but that's all right. I know you got it, right? That's all right. How often do we get this letter and we don't even say, hey, love you too? I actually text back to my wife, L-U-V-U, letter two. A lot of times time we're busy, but I can at least give her five letters out of my day. How hard are we giving to God? How faithful are we in developing that relationship we have? How do we get faith? That's a wonderful thing, but how do we actually get faith? Well, it tells us in Romans 10, 17. We talked about Romans chapter 10 this morning. Romans 10, 17. Faith cometh by hearing, and hearing by what? The Word of God. Faith cometh by hearing. I'm not saying that it means you have to come to church and hear somebody preach the Word of God, but what I'm telling you is you need to come to church and hear somebody preach the Word of God. I ain't saying you have to. I'm saying you should. You always you know what the old expression says, you know, it does not require a parachute to jump out of a plane, but it is a really good thing to have. And it's the same thing with coming to church and hearing the Word of God preached. I can challenge you this, when you're off by yourself, maybe not when you're in a doctor's waiting room or somewhere and you're reading your Bible, read it out loud. Read your Bible out loud. Put your finger on the text and feel. Get as many of your senses involved as you can. Maybe you have a favorite candle or something. I'm not saying you have to go to the level of incense and all these things, but find something that triggers all your individual emotions. Smell your Bible. Am I the only person who ever smells my Bible, especially a new Bible? So you can't do that with a Kindle. Those of you who read your Bible on the phone, don't sniff your phone. That's nasty. Don't do that. But you know what I can do? I can smell it. I can smell it. It tells me in the Bible, it says, what, taste and see that the Lord is good. And they eat the scroll, and some of it's sweet, and some of it's what? Bitter. When you read the Word of God, some of it's sweet, and some of it's hard to take down. Ooh, Lord God, that must be for somebody else. We talked about in Sunday school. You should have been in church. That message was for you. That's what we tell them. And I think, you know, that message was for me. A lot of times, the message is for me as the pastor. Let's dig deeper into the Word of God. Let's see what the faith accomplished in the lives of the old people we talked about. Since we know through the power of the Spirit and a personal relationship with Jesus Christ can do even more. Let's continue into Hebrews 11. Let's go to 11, Hebrews 11 and let's look at... Let's go to verse 4. Verse 4 says, By faith Abel offered to God a more acceptable sacrifice than Cain, through which he was commended as righteous. God commending him by accepting his gifts... And through his faith, though he died, he still speaks. Abel gave his best to God. He gave a true sacrifice. You ever get a chance to read the story in Genesis? And you read about Cain and Abel. 
in the bath, what they brought as a sacrifice. Cain brought a true sacrifice, something that actually cost something. He gave that unto God. Whenever Abel brought that, it was a true sacrifice. Because that it says that though he is dead, Abel still speaks. That's what, that's what the Scripture says. You say, well, Abel gave his sacrifice and he died. Yeah, he did. And yet he still speaks. What he did still speaks. Now, i got to tell you, what Cain did still speaks too, but it doesn't speak to goodness and mercy and faithfulness. It speaks to sin. The faithfulness of giving tithes and offerings of those that supported this church through the years goes on. I talked about, you know, the, the cornerstone here when this church was built. The faithfulness of those people who got together and had bake sales or garage sales or whatever they did to be able to get this church built and this church paid for was the fact that there was a faithfulness in there, and their faithfulness still lives today, right? If I scream real loud, it, the echoes are off of the ceiling that was paid for by people and by their tithes and offerings back then. It's in the buildings that were built, it's in the lives that were changed. We talk about people who were here generations back and that are still here and their families are here. It's by the children that were taught here in the back in the Sunday school rooms. That legacy lives on. How about the ones you'll never know? How about those who give their gifts and give into missions and support missionaries around the world? How many do you know can imagine cities, countries even, won over to Christ because of the faithfulness and giving of one or two individuals? We don't know who they were. We'll never know their names. But their giving went on. It was continual. Their faith did not die. It was a faithfulness that continued to give We heard messages of the importance of giving God the best that we had. We see that and when it says there, by faith Abel offered. We know and we read and we are a full gospel church, which means we believe it all. When it says in there the importance of giving God the first fruits, the 10% off the top of our income. That's all God asks. We used to say, if you can't live off of 90, you can't live off of 100. It's just a fact. We're commanded to do that. Since everybody got quiet when I mentioned about giving and tithes, let's move on to chapter 11, verse 5 and 6. Let's see if I can find y'all there. Because that must have been for the people that aren't here today. Hebrews 11, 5 and 6 says this, By faith Enoch was taken up so that he should not see death, and he was not found, because God had taken him. Now before he was taken, he was commended as having pleased God. And without faith it is impossible to please God. For whoever would draw near to God must believe that God exists, and that he rewards those who seek him. King James says those who what? Those who diligently seek him. Who was Enoch? What do we know about Enoch? Genesis chapter 5 verse 25 tells us this. It says, Enoch walked with God and he was not for God took him. Wow. Enoch walked so closely with God that whenever the day began to wind down, like when you read about God walking in the garden with Adam and Eve, that when God was with Enoch and the day began to come to an end, God just took him home with him. When I read that, I just hear, Enoch, get in the truck, you're coming on for supper. That's the kind of God I have, just to give you an idea. And I'm not going to tell you what brand truck God drives. I'm not doing that this weekend. I'm not going into that. But that's my God. Look, Enoch, get in the truck, you're coming home for supper. That's the relationship I want to have with my God, where God is so enthralled with my faithfulness to Him that He can't stand to be apart from me. You say, well, you can't have that. Then I say, you're a liar. Are the words a liar? Because I see the closeness that Enoch had with God. I want that. God wants that relationship with you. A good friend of mine says that he has no doubt that if God has a refrigerator, your picture's on it. That's the relationship God has with you. The simple little prayers that we offer up that we think are nothing that we bring to God. How many of you put those drawings of your kids up on the refrigerator? Everyone else walks in, they're like, what is that? But to you, that's wonderful because you know what that is. You know what it means. It can be as abstract as anything. You look at it and say, well, yeah, my 
child draw that. That's, that's, that's our family. That's me. That, that glob there, yeah, that's me. All right, wonderful. I love that. God has that relationship with us if we will allow him to. Are you walking with God? Are you two that close together? Does God know that whenever God starts a Sunday morning that he is going to see you here? How many of you get so excited to see someone? As we get older, we're excited to see our kids. My kids are in this, this Sunday. Grace and Jacob are. And I'm excited to be able to see them. And I want to be able to have that time with them. Can you imagine that God himself, as our Heavenly Father, wants that as well? He wants to be able to see us. And not just on Sundays. Hebrews chapter 11 and verse 7 says, By faith Noah, being warned by God concerning the events as yet unseen, in reverent fear constructed an ark for the saving of his household, and became an heir of the righteousness that comes by what? Faith. So righteousness comes by what? Faith. Understanding comes by what? Faith. You say, well, I don't know how to be righteous. I don't even know what that means. Let me tell you what it means to be righteous. It means to do the right thing. You know, there's an old saying says, there's no right way to do the wrong thing. Well, let me tell you, the thing we're pushing for is the right way to do the right thing. That's what it means to be righteous. God commanded us in his word, be you holy as I am holy. We're to align ourselves with the Word of God. Noah did all that he could to save as many as he could. Don't you believe that? He preached a hundred years, whatever it was, to bring in as many as he could to be able to save. And in the end, how many were saved? His family. Well, let me tell you, I don't count that as a failure. How many of us have our children and our grandchildren in church this morning? Even more importantly, how many of us have our children and grandchildren walking in a relationship with Christ Jesus? Let me rephrase that. So I don't count Noah as a failure. The scripture told me, by faith, Noah. By faith, Noah. Noah, I believe in all of his efforts, I believe are expressed in something that John Wesley said one time. John Wesley told us what? He said, do all the good you can by all the means you can and all the ways you can and all the places you can at all the times you can, to all the people you can, as long as ever you can. I think that that's how the life of Noah was expressed. Noah was found righteous because of what? Because he built a boat? No! Noah was found righteous because he was faithful to what God asked him to do. Let's move on to Abraham. We could have sung the song this morning, Father Abraham and many sons. It tells us here in Hebrews 8, 11, 8 through 10, By faith Abraham obeyed. By faith Abraham did what? He obeyed. When he was called to go out to a place that he was not to receive it as an inheritance. And he went out not knowing where he was going. By faith he went to the live in the land of promise. Stepping out of faith, stepping out of your comfort zone is hard to do. It's not something easy to do. How hard was it to get out of bed this morning when it was 25 degrees outside? I'm pretty bad. I won't, I mean, my alarm goes off at 3.30 in the morning on Sunday mornings, and I pick up my phone, and my phone, I, I, the kids were in, so I was going to go into the other half of the house to work on my sermon and finish my slides on this morning. I said, what's the temperature on the other end of the house? I'm not spoiled, so I'm looking at my phone because I have the little nest thing. I was about to turn it up and make sure, but... It learns, it knows my pattern, it knows I get up at 3.30 on Sunday, so it was already warm, so okay, no excuse. I get out and I go finish what I need to do. But I did not want to get out of my comfort zone. I need to get out of that comfort zone to see what God has for us to bless us, to be able to reward that faithfulness. Hebrews 11.11 tells us here that by faith Sarah herself received what? Power. Power to conceive. Even when she was past the age, since she considered him faithful, who had promised? She had faith that God had a promise for her. You realize that Sarah, probably as early as 13 or so, as a young woman, would have begun to pray that God would give her a son. You can't imagine that, the way that that is, but she would have prayed and prayed. That was the one hope was that ever since the Garden of Eden, that, that 
women of Israel, that they would be the one to deliver what? The Messiah. So they would begin to pray, pray, pray in the right order. God, give me a husband. And then God, give me the opportunity to bear a son. Sarah was 90 years old. Her husband was 100. But yet she held on to the faith, we're told here. Some people say, oh, Sarah doubted Sarah life. I'm going to lie what the Word of God says. The Word of God says, by faith, Sarah herself received power to conceive. And she considered God faithful who had promised her. I ask this, you have something you prayed for for years? How many of you in here have something or someone you've prayed for for years? You know what? It may take 90 years for that to be conceived, that promise to be answered, that prayer to be answered, but don't lose faith. I've been in my notes here that says, God's faithfulness is not measured by our faithfulness. You say, what's it mean for God to be faithful? Well, let me tell you, it doesn't mean what it means whenever we say we are faithful. Our faith wavers. It moves with the tides. God's faith does not waver. Sarah never stopped praying. I asked this morning, what are you praying for? A lot of times it's good to be able to write in your Bible in the margins things that you're praying for so that you can flip back through there and see what my God has done. You can see answered prayers. When you write them down, you'd be amazed how many things you pray for them and don't remember that you prayed for them. And then maybe years down the line they come through and you don't give praise and thanks to God because you forgot that you had prayed for that. When I woke up in the middle of the night and I wrote something in my notes that came across me, it says, you know, faith sometimes means you asking something of God. Other time it is God asking something of you. Faith sometimes means you asking something of God. Other times it is God asking something of you. We saw that. Sarah asked God to conceive a son. God asked Abraham to leave where he was and go to another area. And then later down the line, we see God ask Abraham to sacrifice the son, the promise given to Sarah. But Abraham should have never had a reason to waver in his faith because that son was promised to Sarah. He had already seen the faithfulness fulfilled. I ask you this one, what is the dream, what is the promise, what is the person, what is it that you have been praying for that you're holding on to? Has God told you to go somewhere, to go do something, speak to someone, and you haven't done it? You know what I'm going to tell you? You know what? Start over. Start over again. Start right now. You know what, God? Okay. Remind me what I'm supposed to be doing. I'm pretty sure what it is, but remind me, and I'm going to go do it. I want to start over today. What does God ask you to do by faith? Has he told you to embrace something new, a new home, a new name, a new birth in your life, a new birth in this church? We saw a first round of birth. We've seen things that have happened. Let's see and pray that God will continue for us to grow again. Whether we want change or not, there's changes coming to this denomination this year. Votes will happen. Things will occur. Changes are coming. Are we ready for it? Are we praying that God will move us forward? What? By faith. You say, well, I don't understand what's going on. We understand by what? By faith. The old, the present, the future. We read about that in Ecclesiastes. You say, oh, we can't do that. We've done, we can't do that. We've been this name or we've been that for... It doesn't matter. Anything has already been done, it said in the Scripture. But you know what? There's a consistency. This, this morning, we're going to partake from the communion table. In the communion, you see the old, you see the past, you see the present, and you see the future. So many things happen when we come together at the communion table. We call it the table of remembrance. Most of the times, you know, the altar says, do this in what? Remembrance of me. It is the table of remembrance. We recall what? We recall the sacrifice that Christ made for our lives. But we also look forward. We look forward to what we call the marriage supper of the Lamb. We read about that. What the, the, the fact that we have a chance to come together once again around a table and participate with our Christ. We talked about the past. We talked about the future. But I'm not going to talk about the now. Where do we stand now as we come to the communion table? Let us consider our place at the table. 
when we come together. And this will be the last time that we have these little cups. It will be done differently next month. We will come together, come to a table, come to receive. The communion that we come together and we look at the stories of the saints and the old and what we hope for the future, all of that comes together at that. You say, we can't blend the past and the future. Yes, you can. You can. A communion means what? I've told you before. A communion is a common union between two things that are what? Uncommon. You have at the communion table, we bring together the faithfulness of God with the unfaithfulness of us. We come together at the communion table with a sinless God and a sinful man. But through the sacrifice prayed of Christ, we are able to come together on a common ground, on a holy ground, at a communion. And we come together because of the sacrifice of Christ. But we do not come to the table lightly. We do not take what the sacrifices have done lightly. We realize that God told us, speaking in 1 Corinthians chapter 11 through the Apostle Paul, 1 Corinthians 11, 23 through 26, says, Therefore, whoever eats the bread or drinks the cup of the Lord in an unworthy manner shall be guilty of the body and the blood of the Lord. But a man must examine himself, and in so doing he is to eat of the bread and drink of the cup. For he who eats and drinks, eats and drinks judgment to himself, if he does not judge the body rightly. For this reason, many among you are weak and sick, and a number sleep. That means they've died. But if we judged ourselves rightly, we would not be judged. But when we are judged, we are disciplined by the Lord, so that we will not be condemned along with the world. Let us take the time this morning, where we are, to begin to pray and say, Lord God, prepare me to come to your table this morning. Let us pray and prepare ourselves. Let us repent and seek forgiveness. We come to the communion table by faith. Faith in the fact that God hears us in our prayers. Let us pray together as one body, remembering the body and blood of Christ. Merciful God, we confess that we have not loved you with our whole heart. We have failed to be an obedient church. We have not done your will. We have broken your law. We have rebelled against your love. We have not loved our neighbors and we have not heard the cry of the needy. Forgive us, we pray. Free us for joyful obedience through Jesus Christ our Lord. Amen. Let us now prepare the elements. If everyone has not partaken, they have the, we have the table up here ahead. On the night before meeting with death, Jesus took bread. He gave thanks to you, O Lord. He broke the bread, gave it to the disciples, and said, Take, eat. This is my body which is given for you. 
Do this in remembrance of me. Let us eat together. When the supper was over, Jesus took the cup, gave thanks to you, O Lord, gave it to the disciples and said, Drink from this, all of you. This is my blood of the new covenant, poured out for you and for many for the forgiveness of sin. Do this as often as you drink it in remembrance of me. Let us drink together. And so in remembrance of these, your mighty acts in Jesus Christ. We offer ourselves in praise and thanksgiving as a holy and living sacrifice in union with Christ's offering for us. Lord God, upon these people pour out your Holy Spirit on us gathered here and those, Lord God, who are watching from afar. Pour out your Spirit upon these gifts we have received that in the breaking of this bread and the drinking of this wine we may know the presence of the living Christ and be renewed as the body of Christ for the world. Redeemed by Christ's blood until Christ comes in final victory. And we feast at your table forever. Join with me and stand in this, join with me in this exaltation. We all come together in unison through Christ, with Christ, in Christ, in the unity of the Holy Spirit. All honor and glory is yours, Almighty God, now and forever. Amen. You know, in our readings this morning, there are many people mentioned in Hebrews chapter 11. It's like I said, the hall of fame of the saints. But you know, there is still room to add one more name to that list. Your name. By faith, Abraham. By faith, Sarah. And why not by faith, Billy? By faith, and interject your name. I want you to say that with me. By faith, and then say your name. Do it now. By faith, amen. I stand in agreement with you over that. Remember what Ecclesiastes 3.15 told us. That which is, already has been. That which is to be, already has been. And God seeks what has been driven away. Today is the day to accept our Lord and Savior Christ Jesus by faith to come home. What better way and what better day than in the presence of his communion to be able to accept him today. Most gracious Heavenly Father, we thank you for the opportunity to be able to come to you. Lord God, be there any in here that have never accepted you as their Savior. Lord God, I pray today that you draw them home unto you. Lord God, I pray your blessings upon these people, your blessings upon them in health, Lord God, and give them the strength to be able to go out and proclaim your name, that they truly will understand by faith the importance of your command to us to go ye therefore and preach the gospel to all nations. Father God, we thank you and we give you honor and praise. In Jesus' name we pray, amen. Amen. Thank you all and be blessed in the name of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. Amen. Amen.